Thank you very much, Senator Fiorenti Wells. Uh, it being very close uh, to 9.50, uh, I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Uh, and I call Senator Henderson. Senator Henderson. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Madam Acting Deputy President, I rise to raise some serious concerns about the corporate culture which exists in some parts of Australia Post. I had a good dose of this not long after being elected the member for Corangamite when I rallied against a proposal by Australia Post to cut regional mail deliveries in a manner which would have placed the organisation in breach of its performance standards under its community service obligations. There was a subsequent meeting convened in Canberra between coalition members and senators, the then managing director, Mr Fahua, and some of his senior executives. After the formal part of the meeting, I had a private conversation with Mr Fahua when he told me, whilst raising these concerns on the floor of the parliament, that I looked like a horse's ass, and I do excuse the language, but that's what he said. Trying to keep my sense of humour, I replied that I thought that I looked like an effective member of parliament standing up for my electorate. When I mentioned this exchange somewhat casually to a newspaper reporter in 2017 as an example of the rough and tumble which women sometimes endure in politics, Australia Post denied this conversation ever happened. A spokeswoman for Mr Fahua rejected the claims, indicating there were witnesses at the meeting uh, and they were able to support his position. The fact is there were no witnesses. There was no one apart from myself and Mr Fahua involved in this conversation and no one was standing within earshot. And what worried me about Australia Post's response was it the fact that it was willing not to tell the truth about what had transpired and the truth did not matter. I, I did not let this go and eventually I met with the now former managing director, Christine Holgate, who apologised in person but who declined to put that apology in writing. I tell the story because I believe that in any corporation it's not okay, it's not okay to, to lie, to mislead or to deceive. But once again, this, conduct, and this type of conduct has occurred and I'm calling it out because enough is enough. For the past four years, I have worked tirelessly advocating for a new post office for Ocean Grove. From 2016, I supported an Ocean Grove business run by Cameron and Heather Waring, who were seeking to, to establish a licensed post office in the Marketplace Shopping Centre in Shell Road, Ocean Grove. They were experienced post office operators from Point Lonsdale, and the, yet the Warings were continually told there was no rationale for a second post office, despite the massive growth in this part of the Ballerine Peninsula. I have to say, Australia Post fudged the numbers to argue its case, arguing the number of post offices per head of population across the region was more than sufficient, of course, uh, averaging out the numbers and taking into account that a number of towns such as Point Lonsdale, Queenscliff and Bowen Heads had much smaller populations and they all had uh, their own post office. So earlier this year, after moving to the Kingston Village Shopping Centre, which is in the northern part of Ocean Grove, Mr Waring again asked me to take up his case. I convened a meeting with Australia Post and much to our delight, uh, John Cox, who is the General Manager of Transformation and Enablement, and Mr David McNamara, who is the General Manager of Post Office Networks, informed us that Australia Post had decided to place a community licensed post office at the Kingston Village Shopping Centre. They made it clear that the community licence would be subject to an EOI, an expression of interest, but the Warings were clearly in the box seat, given they had a business there, including a tax lotto agency at that very centre. 
So on the 10th of September, I put out a release saying that I was delighted that Australia Post will be establishing a new presence in Ocean Grove and that they were seeking expressions of interest for a three-year licence to manage a new site at the Kingston Village Shopping Centre. I said the community licensed post office will improve postal services for the Ocean Grove community and talked about how I'd been an advocate for the establishment of a second post office in Ocean Grove over a number of years, listening to local voices, including those of the wearing, the wearings, and of course talking about the importance of reliable and accessible postal services to the community. I said the rapidly growing communities in the Kingston and Oak Dean estates of Ocean Grove currently lack appropriate and equitable access to postal services and that this announcement represents a great win for the Ocean Grove community. So I thanked Australia Post for finally listening and for making this very important decision. In the Kerangamite electorate, parcel volumes have increased by over 90 per cent in the months of April, May and June compared to the same period uh, last year, and so the need now is even more so than ever before. Australia Post did publish an expression of interest which did not state that Kingston Village Shopping Centre was the chosen location. That said, Mr Waring and Mrs Waring relied on the representations by Australia Post that the, the decision had been made to place the LPO at Kingston Village and made its submission accordingly. Therefore, there was no requirement to argue as to where the licensed post office should go because that decision had already been made. Last Friday, I learned that Australia Post had reneged on its commitment to locate the post office at Kingston Village, and Mr Cox is now denying any rec recollection of this conversation that he had with us. And what's even worse is that I had a discussion with the acting managing director of Australia Post, Rodney Boyce, this morning who told me that he was backing the version of events by his executives and that he reiterated that Australia Post runs its tenders with a great deal of integrity. I took great issue with what the acting managing director told me because I knew it was untrue. Both Mr Waring and myself were in that meeting when Australia Post said this is the decision we have made. And it goes to the fundamental integrity of Australia Post. It goes to their corporate ethics and it goes to their failure to tell the truth when you see this sort of situation unravel. And in a great deal of irony, the Australia Post has, has determined that the tender should go to uh, another, another group of people who are actually going to operate the business, they say, at the Marketplace Shopping Centre in Ocean Grove. This is the same place that Australia Post said there was absolutely no need over four years for an LPO. And I do note the Australia Post advertisement for a new managing director and group chief executive officer. And one of the points that they're looking for is a managing director who has a strong commitment to first class business ethics and best practice corporate governance. For those who are reading the Hansard or who are listening to this debate tonight, uh, this is one person, one business in one small part of Australia, but it matters a lot because this business run by the Warings is now in peril. And it's in peril because the business which has won the tender is now applying for a tax lotto licence which will further undermine the Waring's business. They knew that, they, that it was not guaranteed they would get this tender, but they relied on the representations made by Australia Post. And it is a breach of Australian consumer law to mislead or deceive in trade or commerce. And that's why I am referring this to the Australian Consumer and Competition Commission for investigation. 
This is not good enough. Australia Post must act with integrity at all times, and I am utterly shocked that they are now denying a conversation that occurred. Australia Post has not told the truth, and I will continue to hold them to account over this disgraceful behaviour. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, uh, Acting Madam Deputy President. I rise to pay tribute to one of our country's leading artists who died recently, and uh, one of his many uh, pieces of work uh, actually sits out front of Parliament House as the mosaic uh, that uh, we all see at the uh, front of Parliament House and certainly to visitors from across the country and overseas who see when they visit here. And I thank the Walpree families for your permission to pay tribute to Mr Nelson Jacamara. His work is an integral part of this building and indeed of this country. Mr Nelson Jacamara was a senior Walpree man and elder of the Papunya community in Central Australia. He was born in the bush and lived at Hearts Bluff until his parents took him to Yundamu for European education at the Mission School. His father was a senior Walpree lawman and Jagamara grew up with the traditional knowledge and stories that later informed his artworks. Like many young men of the time, he left school at 13 and worked at buffalo shooting, driving trucks, droving cattle and in the army before returning to Yundamu and then to Papunya to settle in 1976. Jagamara learnt to paint at Papunya, observing the senior men who were the early trailblazers of the Western Desert Art Movement. He was originally tutored by his uncle, Jabrula, but he quickly developed his own style and began painting in earnest from 1983. Jagamara became known as the master of depicting several dreamings in one work. His works were the stories. To him, that was what was important, using the medium of painting to tell and preserve the dreaming stories. Without the stories, his paintings would mean nothing as far as he was concerned. In 1984, Jagamara won the inaugural National Aboriginal Art Award with his painting, Three Dreamings. This was only a year or so after he started painting on his own account and cemented his reputation as one of the leading talents in the second generation of Western Desert artists. His work was selected to appear in the 1986 Biennale of Sydney, making him one of the first Australian Indigenous artists to gain recognition in contemporary international art circles. In 1987, he was asked to paint a major work to decorate the foyer of Sydney's Opera House, and he chose to paint his possum dreaming, a story that took more than 18 metres in length to tell. The Opera House is not the only iconic building to feature Jagamara's works. A great highlight in his career was in 1988, when he was commissioned to design a 196 square metre mosaic and where did that go? Yes, out the front of the forecourt of our Parliament House here in Canberra. The work was based on his kangaroo and emu dreaming. The mosaic is still as stunning today as it was when Jagamara designed it. He was presented to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth when she officially opened the building. That's Parliament House. During 1988 to 89, one of Jagamara's major works, Five Stories, was reproduced on the catalogue cover for the ASA Society's exhibition, Dreamings, the Art of Aboriginal Australia in New York. His participation in this exhibition included traditional ground painting and ceremonial dance, which he executed with Papunya elder, Mr Stockman. From the traditional to the modern, Jagamara was commissioned in 1989 to paint a BMW M3 racing car. During what was seen as a golden period of development and recognition of the Western desert art movement, Jagamara was at the forefront. He played a visible role, promoting the movement, patiently answering questions about the dreaming stories he painted, sharing his knowledge 
At almost any landmark occasion in Aboriginal art during the golden years of the mid to late 1980s, he was to be found patiently giving the same eloquent, heartfelt answers to the media's questions about why he painted this or that picture and what the dreaming story was. He was not only a talented painter, he, was generously, uh, he generously shared his culture with the world, breaking down barriers and promoting the richness and beauty of First Nations culture, particularly from his Western Desert home. He was an articulate exponent of Western Desert viewpoints on the international uh, famous, on the internationally famous art movement in which he played such a key role. In 1993, Jagamara was awarded the Australian Medal for his services to Aboriginal art. He continued to paint, developing and refining his style while telling his dreaming story, often in collaboration with other Indigenous and non-Indigenous artists. In 2017, a collaboration with non-Indigenous artist Imance Tillers was unveiled here at Parliament House, where he was happy to see his mosaic work was still pride of place. And of course, it also features on our $5 note. Jagamara said of his work at the time, it was fitting. It was in a place where all people come and meet together, just like we do in our ceremonies to discuss and work things out together. May you rest in peace, Jagamara. Our sincere condolences to you, to your family and friends, and to all those uh, who have been greatly influenced by this incredible artist. Senator Seawood. Thank you, um, President. I rise tonight to speak on the Productivity Commission's report into mental health and the impacts mutual obligations and other elements of our social security system have on the mental health of individuals and families. Mental health and wellbeing has, fe has featured prominently this year. The year started with devastating bushfires that deeply scarred communities and our environment. This was followed by the turmoil created by the global pandemic and the impacts of social distancing, isolate, isolation and economic uncertainties. Whilst the government has increased investment in a range of mental health initiatives and support services throughout the year, experts are warning of the mental health pandemic that is yet to come. This makes the Productivity Commission's report particularly important, and I'm glad the government has finally released it. It is a look at how our systems are working or not working, and it, as the case may be and what we need to do better um, to better support mental wellbeing of Australians. The report makes a number of very important recommendations and comments. I'd like to focus on, one key as on the key aspect of the uh, Commission's report that I mentioned this morning, uh, not this morning, sorry, just then at the beginning of my um, contribution, and that's the income of our income support system on mental health of both individuals and families. It should come as no surprise that this government's punitive and bureaucratic social security system systematically fails to support people with mental ill health. At the best of times, our income support system causes anxiety and poor mental health. This has only been exacerbated during a recession, while so many people are living with such uncertainty in their lives. The government's refusal to permanently raise the rate of the job seeker payment means we will see more and more people being pushed into poverty while our, while our economy recovers. For 1.4 million people currently unemployed or underemployed and relying on the job seeker payment, there continues to be a huge amount of anxiety and distress around the future of the coronavirus supplement and how they, and how they will continue to pay their bills, put food on the table and a roof over their heads. Living below the poverty line for an extended period of time is known to have a deteriorating effect on people's physical and mental health. The Commission noted that people receiving income support were more than three times more likely to have depression than those in paid employment, and as, as expressed in one submission, I am receiving Newstart, but it is not enough to live on. 
I'm struggling to pay my rent. I have to choose between food, medicine and paying my bills. Living like this without enough money or support, it is unspeakably awful. It makes you feel like no one cares, like you don't matter. I want to see my, I went, I want to see my psychologist, but I can't even afford to do that. I'm in a dark place. No one should be forced in this country to make decisions about whether you put food on the table or pay for your medications. Not only does living um, in, the, in poverty make access to meaningful mental health treatments difficult, the system itself exacerbates mental health conditions and creates stress and anxiety for people who are already struggling to make ends meet. The Commission also noted the challenges that people with ongoing mental Ill, Ill health face when trying to re-enter the workforce. These challenges mean individuals actually require a more tailored approach when it comes to working with employment providers and not the cookie-cutter job plans that are currently the go. I continue to hear people are being unsupported by providers who have a lack of awareness and training, who are more interested in churning through participants than genuinely engaging with their needs, their career goals and how best to support them. It is no wonder that the Commission found that outcomes for job active participants with mental ill health are significantly worse, with 82 per cent spending more than 12 months on the program compared to 64 per cent of the wider job active population. The Commission also pointed out that the job seeker classification instrument is failing to accurately place people in the streams they need to get the best support for their circumstances. The, the JSCI fails to detect mental ill health, resulting in participants being incorrectly streamed and laden with unrealistic uh, mutual obligations that will only cause them more stress and anxiety. As a result, they are more likely to receive demerit points and have their payments suspended. With mutual obligations now being enforced again, I have deep concerns about the increased pressure and anxiety job seekers will, with mental ill health will be feeling. It was revealed at estimates that in less than, the, in less than 30 days of mutual obligations being re reinstated, 74,434 payments were suspended by Centrelink. This is almost 75,000 penalties issued in less than 30 days. It was later revealed during the last sitting of Parliament that that, had, that number of suspensions had risen to 250,112 suspensions. That's a quarter of a million suspensions. We know from previous Senate inquiries how distressing it can be to receive a notification that your payment has been suspended for failing to meet one of your mutual obligations. The Commission noted clearly and with no uncertainty that the implications implementation of stringent mutual obligation requirements for people with mental ill health will aggravate their symptoms and increase distress, the very system that this government is implementing. The targeted compliance framework is an incredibly blunt instrument allowing employment providers to suspend a payment, creating a cascading effect of distress and anxiety in individuals and their families. This is a punitive and punishing system that fails to treat participants like real human beings and causes immense damage to a person's emotional and physical well-being. We have also found ourselves in a situation where, where we have thousands of people on the job seeker payment with only a partial capacity to work, but are not unwell enough or disabled enough to have access to the disability support pension. Changes to the eligibility criteria for the DSP in 2012, including the requirement to be fully diagnosed, treated and stabilised, has particularly affected the ability of people with complex mental health conditions and psychosocial disabilities to prove their eligibility for the DSP. Many complex mental health conditions are episodic in nature. Treatments and, re and reports from psychiatrists can be very expensive, particularly if you're trying to survive on the job seeker payment and the application process is incredibly bureaucratic, with the whole process for applying for the DSP making it incredible, incredibly difficult for people with poor mental health and mental health conditions. Requirements to complete a program of, su of support further complicate the eligibility process and leave people living in poverty on the job seeker payment for an extended and unnecessary period of time, 
people living with poor mental health being further distressed by the very system that's supposed to be supporting them. The Productivity Commission has made it clear that mutual obligations, the rate of the job seeker payment and the DSP eligibility process are all exacerbating the mental ill health of income support recipients. So I call on the government to implement the reforms of the Productivity Commission report so that we can begin the work that is required to ensure we have systems in place that supports those with mental ill health into recovery and well-being so they can live a good life, so their well-being is looked after. We have a system that is literally making people sick and sicker. This has to include reforms to our social security system. I call on the government to permanently increase the job seeker payment, abolish the targeted compliance framework and reform the employment services system and mutual obligation and the system of mutual obligations. They are not working. They are affecting people's mental health. If the government is serious about mental health reform, they will take on board these recommendations. They will change the system that, as I said, is not helping people. It is making people sicker. Mental health reform includes all aspects of the system in this country, not just support services, treatment services, but the underlying social determinants of that mental ill health. It is time for reform across the board. Please, please, I beg the government, take those comments from the Royal Commission on board, take the recommendations on board and change the system. Thank you, Senator Seward. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 12 noon.